14 teams come to compete, but only one will win the crown. The Heart of the Nation will host the Atlantic 10 Men's Basketball Championship at Capital One Arena in March of 2018. Five days of nonstop basketball action. There can only be one champion. Don't miss this major college championship at Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C., March 7th through 11th, 2018. Buy your tickets now at Ticketmaster.com. Welcome to another edition of the A-10 Podcast. I'm Andy Pants, and we're going to start off this edition of our show with St. Bonaventure head coach Mark Schmidt. That's great news because finally his back, backcourt is back to the way he thought it would be with Jalen Adams uh, back on the lineup to join Matt Mobley. Uh, what was it like, Coach, to finally get your senior guards out on the court uh, in what basically you thought would be the case uh, from the beginning of the season? Yeah, it's a good feeling. As you know, it's you, you win with guards. And, you know, we thought going into the season that we had two of the better guards in the country. Um, you know, and when Jay went down um, in the uh, exhibition game, you know, we didn't know it was going to be this long. Um, and, you know, it's hurt us. It's, you know, hopefully in the long run, it's going to help us, you know, where we get some young guys into the into the mix. But, um, you know, we got Jay back against Buffalo and he still wasn't 100 percent. You know, he only had practice one day before, but just getting him in the lineup and, you know, he's gives us a, a sense of comfort uh, he's the quarterback you know the guys really trust him and even though he wasn't 100 percent, he just you know he still he brought us you know that that the iq the understanding of how to play getting the guys the ball and i think matt was probably the you know the happiest guy on our team because now it's you know we can get him off the ball where he's not a a true point guard he's a he's a scorer and now he can he can play off jay and you know hopefully you know as we go forward you know both those guys can stay healthy so look, they're not twins, but they play together they're almost like <laughs> brothers on the court. Um, you know, and, and that's rare to have, you know, a couple of guards that have played a couple of years together like this, especially in the, the way there's so much turnover in the sport right now. What have you noticed when the two of them are out there together in terms of how they can read each other on the court, where to be and how to play off each other so well? I think it's a trust. I, I think, um, you know, Jay has a, a much better, you know, understanding of how to be a point guard and how to get guys involved. Um, and he understands where, you know, Matt is at all times. I think, you know, Matt's more of a scorer where Jay's more of a, a distributor first and gets guys involved. And, you know, Matt can really play off of Jay really well. When Jay drives, you know, Jay's looking to pass. Um, you know, so there, there's it's much more of a, of a comfort. They, they understand how to play with each other. Uh, they've been playing with each other for three years, you know, even when Matt was a red shirt, um, had to sit out when he transferred from Central Connecticut State. So, um, you know, they're, they're experienced guys. They've always, they've been in situations. Nothing's going to surprise them. Um, and it gives me, you know, talking about comfort, it gives me as a head coach, you know, a lot of, a lot of comfort knowing that those guys have been in those situations. And, you know, for the most part, they're going to make the right plays. You know, it looked like you scheduled knowing you were going to have a pretty good team, uh, you know, playing the tournament down in Florida. You end up playing Maryland. You win that game 63-61. You end up playing a TCU team, which I think could end up being a top three Big 12 school. And, yeah. um, you, know, you, you know, did you try to, to look for a tournament like that, which I know is not easy for you guys to get games, uh, to where you yeah. can maybe play some teams that will ultimately help you in, in power ratings? Yeah, I think, you know, that's, this is the hardest non-conference schedule that we've had since I've been here. Um, and we did that for a reason. We thought we, you know, we had a decent team coming back and it's really, as you said, it's really hard for us to get, you know, power five t teams to come to the rally center. Um, so it's important for us to, to go out and, you know, try to play some of these teams on a neutral court. Um, you know, we got Vermont uh, up in Rochester, which will be a, a, a terrific game, you know, we're going to Syracuse as you, uh, you know, you talked about the, the Maryland and TCU game and even some of our bye games, you know, playing Yale at home, playing Northeastern at home. Th those, are, those aren't easy games at all. So, you know, hopefully, um, you know, we play well in those games. We get some victories and it helps us, you know, as we go into the Atlantic 10 and then hopefully it helps us in March. Now you say it's hard to get Power 5 schools to come to the Riley Center. I I'm trying to remember the last one. I mean, you know something? It's funny. The last one we had was Mississippi State, and that was like my, my third year. And I remember, um, you know, those guys you know, after the game talking to the coaching staff. And, you know, when those guys got off the plane in Buffalo, they were looking for the Empire State Building. And um, <laughs> the Empire State Building six hours away. You know, so that was the last team. And like I said, we, we try, but no one will come. And even at the very beginning of our you know, tenure here, you know, we, we – 
we play Power 5 teams up in Rochester. But now because of they're playing 20 games and so forth, it's really hard. We can't get anybody to come to Rochester. So that's why we're playing Vermont. They had the kid Lamb who's from Rochester. Um, and then we started playing some Atlantic 10 teams up there too. So it's difficult, but at the same time, you know, you've got to be creative. And that's one of the reasons why we've played. Uh, we played that, the, the tournament down in, um, in Florida. Well, I, and I got to think that even getting those tournaments – you know, is not so easy. I mean, some of these tournaments that are around the country, especially the three-day ones, you know, whether yeah, they are, yeah. you know, uh, in, in Florida or Hawaii or Vegas. I mean, how how hard has scheduling been for you to just at least get those kind of opportunities? Yeah, it's really it, – it's it's difficult. It's difficult. It's, um, you know, just getting into those – getting invited to those tournaments. We're going to um, the Cayman Islands next year, which is, you know, a positive for us. Um, but it's been it's been difficult. I, I think now that you know we're getting a little bit better, and I think now you know people uh, are you know making more phone calls for us to play in these types of tournaments. But early on, it was really hard. Um, but it's 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 not as hard as as people think to get into these tournaments. It's you know it's it's just really difficult for us to get you know home and home games with with really good teams. Like you know last year we had to we had to buy UNC Wilmington and you know to come to our place. And, you know, I think they were at the time they were had an RPI of 13. You know, what, you know, there's not a lot of teams in the country that are buying, you know, the you know, 13th RPI team in the country to come to their place. So that's challenging, but, um, you know, something that we have to understand and, you know, it's, can't worry about it. We just have to play. What is it about the makeup of this group, though, that you feel comfortable taking them on the road so much, especially, you know, as I'm noticing here, uh, you know, the Rochester game obviously is just a bus trip, but, you know, for a yeah. good chunk of the non-conference, you need this group to be together so that they can handle the road. Yeah, no question. And, and you know, it's it's been good, you know, you know when Jay was hurt, um, you know, just going, you know, going down to Destin and, and knowing you're playing Maryland and TC or New Mexico without your best player, you know, it's, you know, from a coach's standpoint, you're a little bit nervous and like, you know, you wish you, it was going to be difficult. Um, two games down there with Jay. Um, but, you know, give our guys uh, credit. They went down there without their best player and really hung in there and, you know, had a great win against Maryland and, uh, and you know, really hung with, uh, with TCU. And we say it all the time. It's, you know, when you go on the road, um, you know, you, gotta, you better be a united team. You know, you, you better be together. You better be looking out for one another and, um, and especially without, without our best player. So it's, it's, it's been good. It's, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the effort the guys have given so far without our, our point guard. And, you know, hopefully we get him back and, you know, we can go forward and, and have a successful season. You know, what does it say right now about you guys and Rhode Island when you think about it that uh, these two teams, the two favorites, have wins, you know, you guys over Maryland, Rhode Island over Seton Hall and Providence without arguably their most heralded player? I mean, for you guys, that was yeah. without Adams, and for them, it was w- without E.C. Matthews. Yeah, yeah it, it just shows that there's, you know, both teams have more than just, you know, one player. Um, you know, I watched the, the Providence game, and, um, you know, Rhode Island, has, you know, they just come off with players, and, you know, it's, it's like the Bill Belichick mentality. It's next man up, and if you have enough guys and, and they have that mentality, then it, it is, you know, next man up, and he goes in, and like us with, with Nelson Caputa, you know, he – he takes Jalen's spot, and you know he's not Jalen, but you know for a couple, three games, you you can you can get away with that. And you know we 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 have more players than just Jalen and Matt, and and I think our guys play with that chip on their shoulder to make sure you know the people know that hey, this is not a one man show or a two man show. It's it's a team, and that's that's how we beat Maryland. It wasn't just one guy. You know Courtney Stockett comes off the bench and you know hits the game winner. So other guys step up, and that's what I, I think a, a good team um, has. It has that that mentality. Of you know you can't make excuses, can't worry about who you have, who you don't have. We're going to go with who we got, and let's go and play ball. So over the next uh, three weeks, you know, before you get to your A10 opener against UMass on December 30th, yeah. what needs to be tweaked with this group, especially with the Adams back in the lineup? Yeah, it's it's now it's it's trying to get Jay back in. You know, we hadn't practiced in a month, and you know we had been you know going without him and and practicing without him. Now it's hard to get him back in the mix. You know, and and he's still rusty. Believe me, you know, only practicing one time in in 30 days, so he's still a, a work in progress. And you know, so we have to continue to get guys, you know, comfortable with with, in essence, uh, new roles. We, you know, Isaiah, uh, our, our freshman, who was someone that 
you know, was playing a lot. Now he's going to have to take a little bit of of um, uh, a minutes uh, reduction. Um, these guys have to step up and, and and understand their roles. And now now we just have to get back to playing and getting that chemistry back that we had, you know, prior to Jay um, getting hurt. And and also it's like when we know it, just like every team, it's I, I say it all the time. It's no team stays the same. Either you get better or you get worse. And and we got to continue to get better if we want to go to where we want to what we want to do, um, you know, in March, you know, we can't stay stagnant. Um, and we just got to continue to work and, and in all phases, offense, defense, you know, the, the, the special situation type things, we, we got to get better. And, and I think our guys understand that. And, um, but it's, it's good to have a, a quarterback back and, you know, hopefully he can, you know, get healthier, um, and, and really take us to where we want to go. You know, Mark, when we were convening in the uh, in October at the ATM Media Day, that was around the time of all this negativity, and there was that FBI investigation that's still ongoing. And yet, as the season heads into its second month, uh, to me, it seems all in the rearview mirror. I mean, I know it's out there somewhere, but there's been so many great games, great storylines. Uh, what has this month of the college basketball season shown you about its resiliency and basically its you know, universal ability to, to sort of bring teams, players, fans all together for, for the love of the game. Yeah. When, the, when, when the games go on, you forget about all the stuff that's going on, you know, outside, um, you know, and I think it's, it just shows that the game is such a special game and it's really competitive. There's great games and, and, and that's, and, and that's how it should be, you know, all the stuff that's been going on, you know, off the court with the recruiting and, and all that stuff, that's, that is a negative, but I think when you stop playing the games, you know, it's really, it's a healing process. You know, people forget about, you know, what is going on off the court and, and they just, you know, watch, you know, you watch really athletic, skilled players play the, a game that they love, the passion that they have, you know, the, the passion that the coaches have. It's, and I've said it over and over again, it's the, it's the greatest game in the world. It's, um, you know, and I think you see that um, because of the joy and, and the passion that, that the players and the teams have for this game. And, you know, when we were together in October, I, I just got such a great sense from Jalen and Matt about how much they appreciated playing at St. Bonaventure and all that they receive for playing there. I mean, how much do you think that is definitely something that is exhibited from your seniors. Uh, this is, yeah, this is a, a special place. And, and until you get here and, and realize it, you know, everybody, you know, really talks negative about, you know, where we're located and so forth. And there's no better place. If you're a college basketball player and you want to go to a place, you know, that's not in the city, uh, the passion that the fans have for, for Bonaventure basketball and the passion that they have for the players, it, it, it is unbelievable. And you can't, I can't really put it into words. But, you know, once you get up here and you, you play for Bonaventure, you know, it's the old adage, you know, once a Bonnie, always a Bonnie. And it, it's a special place. And I think those kids realize um, the great opportunity that's been given them. Um, and they're running with it. You know, th those two guys have had terrific careers and you know, hopefully they can end it the right way. But it's this is this is something that's, you know, there's not very many places in the country that, you know, have a can have a school and, you know, that you know, 13,000 people in Olean that can come every night and have a sellout crowd um, and, and have it be the, the the place to go. When people talk about you going to the game tonight, if you're in New York City or some big city, it's like, what game are you talking about? Right. In, only in New York, when they say you go to the game tonight, it's one game. It's Bonaventure basketball, and, and the, the, the gym is electric, and there's no better place to play when, when um, you know, on a Saturday night in, in front of the Bonaventure, you know, alums, the community and our students. You know, one, one last thing, Mark, to, to that point, when you're the head coach there and you know that everyone's waiting for the game and, and yeah. they're anticipating, obviously, uh, you know, that you guys are going to play at a high level, uh, unlike if, if you're in a city that's got a million other entertainment uh, options, how much responsibility mm -hmm. is it on you to make sure you deliver that kind of product that people are going to want to come out and see? because you know, for lack of a better term, there aren't as many things to do in the community. So that's why it becomes exactly. such a, a focal point You're every exactly winter. Right. Yeah, the winter time, it's, you know, people talk about, you know, Bonaventure basketball gets them through the winter time. And it, there's a big responsibility. And I take the job really, really seriously. My job is to make sure that, you know, when those people leave, the fans leave and walk to their 
to the parking lot that they may not say that the team was well coached or they have great players, but they're going to say those guys play really, really hard and they really compete. And that's what we got to do every night. And there's a responsibility being the head coach here that, that we put a product on the, on the court that's blue collar, that, that represents the community that we live in. And, um, and, then, and that's what we've tried to do for the 11 years that we've been here. And hopefully um, we can continue to do that. Mark Schmidt, the head coach of the St. Bonaventure Bonnies, uh, right now clearly one of the top two teams in the Atlantic 10 with Rhode Island. Thanks for joining us, Mark. Thanks, Andy. Thanks for having me. The Heart of the Nation will host the A-10 Men's Basketball Championship at Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C. Five days of nonstop basketball action, March 7th through 11th, 2018. Buy your tickets now at Ticketmaster.com. And now joining us here on the A-10 Podcast, LaSalle's B.J. Johnson, fresh off uh, LaSalle's trip to Northern Ireland where they played in Belfast and uh, ended up losing to Towson but beat Holy Cross 58-54. Um, we were talking a little bit offline here, B.J., about this kind of trip, but what was the toughest part, maybe the most challenging part for you uh, in going to play basketball in Northern Ireland? Um, for me, I think the biggest thing was you know, trying to eat, trying to eat, eat the right things while we were over there. Um, that's a big part of um, having energy and being, uh, you know, productive and efficient on the court. And um, I think I just couldn't, you know, get get uh, acquainted with the food that was there. So I think that was my biggest issue. Splitting this trip, though, losing to a Towson team, which clearly is better, I think, than people projected, and knocking off a Holy Cross team that, you know, has had a decent year so far. What do you think that will do in terms of springboarding this team going forward where you've already beaten Temple in the Big Five, uh, you've already beaten Penn, um, you know, so you have some good victories already this season to this point. Um, no, in the trip, we, we did some good things. We did some bad things. Uh, I guess uh, going forward, we could just look at the film from that and try to incorporate that incorporate that going forward but um we know uh based on our a couple of our victories we had this year that you know we're a good team if you know we can get consistent and um i think a lot of that just has to do with you know going uh going forward keep uh continuing to play with each play around with each other and uh you know getting more um more team like just gelling more as a team and uh Again, I think that happens, you know, by uh, just playing games and, you know, um, learning each and every game how we play, uh, whether it's good or bad, and just trying to go go forward from there. I mean, really, outside of Rhode Island and to some extent St. Bonaventure, you could argue that this league is wide open. Um, by the time you get to league play, which will be right around December, looks like December 30th when you take on St. Louis. Where, do you, where does this team need to be specifically to, so that it's clicking at the right level so that you guys can make a run for, you know, like a top four finish in the league? Um, we need uh, a couple guys to step up. Um, we need to get back to – uh, defensively to the uh, the mindset we had when we started the year when we were holding teams to, you know, 37, 38% from the field. And um, I think that's the biggest part, just trying to get back to that defensive mindset that we started the year with and, uh, you know, just trying to stop teams from scoring. Uh, in every game, we're not going to, you know, score as much as we need to, but um, when you play good defense and you stop the other team from uh, scoring, you always give your team a chance. You know, as you head into your the, sort of the heart of your senior season, you know, your dad played there from 86 to 90. Um, can you put in perspective what's it like to follow sort of in his footsteps and really you could argue, you know, uh, obviously um, – to be more successful in terms of uh, your your production on the court. Um, I mean, we really don't try to put too much uh, no emphasis on uh, me following his footsteps. Uh, just kind of my path, you know. He he's uh, 
you know, a big part of what I do. But um, I think me and him both, you know, accept the fact that right now is about me and not so much about uh, following, you know, what they did in the uh, when he was here. But um, now I guess it is kind of a competition, like internally, I guess, to try to, you know, be successful because, uh, you know, they had a lot of success. And uh, this being my last year, I'm trying to, uh, you know, try to bring some more excitement back you know, to LaSalle. What is it about the, the LaSalle program in terms of what it means to you and to your family? Um, I mean, it's just, I guess, in my DNA to, to a certain extent, uh, you know, this was pretty much the first, you know, college basketball team I knew. Um, and then, you know, after leaving Syracuse, it was um, pretty much just a no-brainer to come back here. Uh, the coaching staff showed a tremendous interest in me. The, you know, the team accepted me right away. So, I mean, it's a place uh, – Philadelphia is a place I already know. So, I mean, that pretty much just so the deal. You know, when, when, when players transfer – um, you know, it can be for a, a, a thousand different reasons. Statistically, it clearly looks like this was the right call by you. Uh, I mean, your your point production went from, you know, four at Syracuse up to 17 to now up to 21. When you look back at that decision, and sometimes the decisions aren't always the, are not always the right one, why was this the, the right move for you to make in your career? Um, just at the time, I don't think I was, uh, playing confidently. And I thought, you know, at that time, it was a time, it was the best time to, you know, try for a change of scenery. Um, if I stay, who knows? Um, I could be averaging 20 at Syracuse right now, but, um, that's the decision I chose to make at the time. And, you know, I'm pretty, pretty uh, satisfied with that. Well, BJ, we appreciate you joining us here on the A10 podcast, and uh, we hope to check in uh, during the course of the season. Thank you. Yep, no problem. Appreciate it. Hey, A10 fans, join us at the Richmond Coliseum in Richmond, Virginia, March 2nd through the 4th for the Atlantic 10 Women's Basketball Championship. Purchase tickets at the Richmond Coliseum box office, Ticketmaster.com, or by calling Ticketmaster at 800-745-3000. And now joining us here on the A10 podcast, Dyla Milson, the head coach of George Mason's women's basketball team. And uh, coach, let's go a little bit broad first about uh, rebuilding this program. You guys are off to a sensational start this season. And, uh, you know, obviously, whenever you take over a program, it doesn't happen automatically unless you've got a ready made team that you took over. So as you look back here, is you, you know, in your fifth year here at Mason, what do you think were sort of the key decisions that you made early on that have sort of translated to you guys getting off to the kind of start you're at right now? Yeah, it's been a long um, process, as as we all know, and, and you said it, unless you've taken a, a ready-made team and program over, it, it takes time, and uh, we certainly didn't do that at Mason um, our first year. Here was our first year in the A-10, uh, so we transitioned from the CAA and hadn't been real successful there. So, you know, I, I think the big thing is, is we've just, um, you know, committed to what uh, the process that, that we wanted to take. Uh, we've committed to uh, the values that we wanted to stand for and uh, continue to recruit the type of, of first of all, people uh, that we felt like were going to be good fit for uh, Mason, not only on the floor, but uh, academically, uh, socially, and everything else that that goes along with being a student athlete. Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I think the other thing is just really, really staying committed to uh, the daily grind that it takes to to build, um, you know, to build a program. And secondly, to be successful, um, you know, we're hoping not only to build but maybe sustain that. And you know, just it, it, it takes so much. Um, commitment to uh, every day to the to the um, getting in the training room to getting in and getting extra shots up to uh, just what it takes you know three to five whatever hours you are practicing and uh, you know we've we've finally found that those student athletes that um, really have bought into to the process and I've got a great staff right now and uh, you know that's that's always a challenge we've had some turnover there but 
Um, you know, I, I think we've got a really, really good group of people right now. So we're just really excited about about our start and certainly hoping we can um, carry some momentum into the A-10 play. Yeah, I mean, you know, you won seven of your first nine games. And, and I think what jumps out even more is you're winning games now. You could argue the games that you're supposed to win if you're at, you know, a sort of a higher A-10 level. Not that you can't beat, you know, a Michigan or – you know, uh, you know, Colorado, Colorado. The, sort of the power, <laughs> the power five schools that were on your schedule. But what does it take and mean to you to to sort of get your program to that level where okay, every time we go on the floor, you know, if there's a team of equal value, if you not or below, that's a game we should win or should be right there to win, and then at least be competitive in those sort of up games. You know, I've done this for a long time, um, and and you're exactly right that. You know, you, it, when you finally get you, the program to a level that, you know, you look at your schedule every year when you build it and, and you've got some games that um, you better win. Uh, you've got some games that, you know, might be 50-50 games. And, um, you know, you've got some games that you're going to have to play at your best and in, in order to win. And, um, you know, I think we've done that. I, I think we had, a, you know, a couple of 50-50 games even on our schedule that, that we have won this year. And, um and that's been the process also in, in building this program. You you look at our first year, and um, and I know we're not to the A-10 yet, but uh, you look at the first year, and we were getting beat 30, 40 points nightly. And the, the next year, you know, we were uh, a little more competitive, but uh, still getting, you know, blown out. And, and uh, you know, then the last couple of years, we've taken some teams to, to overtime. Uh, we've probably beat some people we maybe shouldn't have beat. Um, and, and again, that a lot of that I'm really comparing to A-10 play, but, uh, you know, every year we've gotten more and more competitive. So, you know, we're hoping this, this is a year that we can, can continue to, um, you know, win these last few games in our non-conference and go into the A-10 and, you know, we're only picked eight, which, uh, probably is, is a fair assessment to be picked going in, um, you know, to the, to the season, but, you know, we're hoping we can break through and, um, you know, again, beat the people you're supposed to beat and, and hopefully knock off a, a few that uh, you're not supposed to. And, you know, right now we're playing really well at home and, and defend that home floor. And the Michigan and Colorado game gave us uh, a lot of confidence, even though we ended up getting beaten both of those. Um, both games we played very, very well until coming down the stretch and just didn't have, you know, quite have the size and probably experience to compete on, on their home floors. But um, certainly excited about where we're at. So how did you manage losing like that early in in your tenure at Mason? Um, It was a little stressful. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) You know, it was uh, not, not certainly what I was, I was used to. And, um, but you know, that first team, I look back and, 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 you know, those, uh, those players were recruited to, to play a CAA schedule. And fortunately I had a Taylor Brown who was, was very, very talented and was able to, uh, you know, at least keep us in some games for a while, but, you know, those those players worked, and, and, and I have I've told them, you know, from the very beginning that, you know, at least, uh, you know, when we do get and we're going to get this program turned around, you know, they're going to be a part of, of the reason that we did because, you know, they had to buy into a new coach, a new conference, lots of things. But um, it was uh, definitely a, a stressful few years. You know, you, you've got upperclassmen and, and, and younger. It seems like you got a nice balance, whether you could say, you know, the scoring you're getting from Natalie Butler. You know, uh, Nicole or Cardano Hillary is a freshman. So, you know, you've got this sort of interesting balance with this team this season that not everyone always has where you can sort of rely on experience and a player who can produce and a freshman who's suddenly making an impact. You know, we do have a, a nice mix. And, and sometimes I forget when you know we go through a stretch that we're not playing very well or we may not quite have the focus in practice. We're still really young. You know, we're starting a freshman and two sophomores. Um, you know, our first two players off the bench right now are freshmen. Um, but obviously Natalie Butler has added a, a huge dimension to what what we're doing. Uh, very, very fortunate. And we know in the, in the recruiting game, sometimes uh, those good luck um, things happen to you. So, uh, you know, Natalie's added uh, not only what her scoring and her rebounding, what she's done on the floor uh, on game night um, to win games has been huge. But what she's brought to us day in and day out, um, playing for national championship at UConn and, um, you know, the experience that she gained there and her physical presence and all of the other things that, that come along with uh, being the talent level that she is. Um, but 
you know, you you, you said it. Um, you know, uh, Nikki has has stepped in at the point guard, and um, I, I knew she was going to be a good player. I, I didn't know she was maybe going to be uh, quite as impact scorer for us quite this early. Uh, I knew she had it in her, but uh, you know, for a freshman to do what she's done has been pretty incredible. And then J.C. Bolton is a sophomore. She was on the A-10 all-rookie team last year. But, um, you know, I have to go back even to to J.C.'s freshman year. I think she way overperformed. She came from a high school in Missouri that had a class of 22, uh, so very, very tiny high school. Um, and, again, I knew she was going to um, be able to play for us and, and uh, be an impact at some point in time or I wouldn't have recruited her. But I certainly didn't think she would get done what she got done in her freshman year. And, you know, now she's almost doubled her numbers uh, as a sophomore. So um, we're getting good production. Uh, I think probably the most positive thing about this team right now is, um, you know, their chemistry is good. And it's been good since last March, since we started started off season uh, through the summer. And um, and I know winning takes care of a lot of that, too. Uh, when you've done it as long as I have, winning is a, is a big key component. But even through adversity, this team is certainly being mature and, um, you know, you don't really look out there and go, oh my gosh, freshmen and sophomores, um, you know, they're handling themselves very, very well. When you look back at your start, you know, junior college in the Midwest and, in, in, uh, you know, uh, in, in Kansas and you were Drury, um, Drury College. Can you look back at that time and sort of look back at, at, at how hard it was to get to this point where the amenities are obviously quite different than what you had when you were starting out? Oh my gosh. I guess I say, I look at Nikki and JC and I didn't think they would do what they did early in their career. Um, 33 years ago, I'm not sure I ever thought I would be at the division one level and, um, you know, getting to do the things that I, I'm doing now, but I'm very blessed. Uh, I obviously I started at the high school level and, um, my first year as head coach of the women's, of the girls team, uh, we were three and 18, uh, and it was, uh, <laughs> stressful, but I, 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 obviously first year of coaching, um, I, you know, I'd never been through that, but as a player, I had never played on a losing season. So I thought, oh my gosh, this, not sure this gig is for me. I think, uh, maybe I'll go try something else, but, you know, I stuck with it. And I, uh, I think one of the things that I've always kind of had a gift for is, uh, you know, a passion for my players, and, and I've uh, always had uh, student athletes that I feel like, it, you know, would run through a wall for me, and, um, you know, I just stayed at it, and, and uh, in the third year that I, after I started a head coach, uh, we were playing uh, for a state championship uh, at a at a place that had never won before, and, uh, you know, I've been at three or four other places, and I've always been able to elevate the program, and uh, so it's been, it's been a fun journey, and you know, you kind of have to take the, the ups and the downs. But, I, you know, the biggest thing for me, and I know in this profession, winning is the bottom line, particularly at this level. But, uh, you know, the biggest thing for me is to, you know, continue to make impact in, in young women's lives and uh, help them make a change and, and do the things, chase their dreams, be able to uh, be successful on the basketball floor. But, uh, you know, whatever dream that they have in, in their world, um, you know, that that's the biggest thing for me. And I feel like in my 33 years, I've, I've certainly done that. And as long as I can continue to do that and God willing, I'll uh, continue to um, put the sneakers on every day. Now, your parents uh, still live near uh, Springfield, Missouri? They do. They uh, they still live there and uh, they uh, have what do they think they... of your Yeah. What do they think of your journey, especially when uh, they were there at the beginning of watching you sort of struggle to get through this uh the, the the lean years, if you will. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that because they actually, uh, they hadn't seen us play in two years live and I brought them back with me uh, this week and they get to see three games uh, this week here. And because uh, until a couple years ago, they're, my dad's 81, my mom's 79. And uh, until a couple years ago, they went every place they followed and, and my dad would drive six hours and, and watch us play and turn back around and uh, so, you know, I've kind of been the, the shining star of, of my dad's eye, if you will. Um, so they're, they're very, very proud. And I'm, I'm obviously very, very blessed uh, that, you know, that they pushed me and, you know, they allowed me to, uh, to follow my dreams and, and hauled me around to uh, do whatever I needed to do when I was a, was a young kid. But, um, you know, very, very blessed that I've had a family that has supported me. I've got a husband, been married almost 30 years and two kids and, 
every move we've made has been uh, so mom can coach and mom can have a, a team. So, um, you know, from my parents to, to my husband, to my kids, uh, I'm just one lucky lady. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because so often you see, you know, your parent, parents will drive hours to see their child play. It's a little different when they watch their child coach. I mean, how much, especially your dad, was he sort of, and, I, and I've seen this at, you know, on the men's level, whether it's Chris Collins and Doug Collins or, um, you know, Homer Drew and Bryce Drew or Bob Hurley and Dan Hurley, you know, they're, 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 they're sort of cringing in the stands and every call, they, 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 they feel it. I mean, how much does your dad sort of, you know, <laughs> sort of feel uh, he, the same way with you? Absolutely, he, he does. And um, I think it's really tough right now for my mom to sit in front of the computer screen with him. And uh, I think he, he uh, still gives a lot of uh, opinions. So I told him when uh, we walked in the gym yesterday, I said, now you're going to have to remember tomorrow night, Dad, that we are you are live now and you're back behind the bench. So um, make sure that you're uh, careful with what you say. And, of course, he just laughed. But, you know, this is what he what he lives for right now. And to see those. Uh, again, the young women that, uh, you know, I talk about every day and, and, uh, you know, it just means so much for them. And, um, so it's, it's an exciting time and I'm certainly blessed that I, I get to have him in the stands for the next three games. All right. So before we let you go now, this rodeo aspect of your life, where did that play in that? Uh... <laughs> you know, I started to say a minute ago, you know, they hauled me all over the country to do whatever I needed to do. And it actually yeah. was. It was to rodeo and not play ball because we yeah. really didn't have much of the AAU uh, that many years ago. So, you know, my grandfather um, was one of the old time cowboys. I'm sure you've heard of Dodge City, Kansas, and that's where oh, my yeah. dad's uh, family grew up. And literally my, my grandfather, uh, he passed away in his late 70s and he rode horses until they uh, had to had to carry him off and, and uh, not allow him to, to get on anymore. Um, so that's kind of where that started. And so I, I grew up in a small Western Kansas town and um, that's what we did in the summer. And uh, so I, I rodeoed all my life and uh, went to K-State on a, on a rodeo scholarship. And uh, not many people know that about me. You have to you have to dig a little bit to, <laughs> to, to get that one. But, uh, you know, I enjoyed it. And, and, you know, back in that time, that's, you know, you, you had your different things, but, you know, we didn't have an opportunity to play summer basketball and, and those kind of things. So that's where I got my, you know, my friendships and my competitiveness and, and those sort of things. I obviously I played, played in high school, but um, you know, rodeo was kind of our outlet in the summer and uh, lots of good friends, lots of good memories and um, something different. But uh, I, I can tell you, you get the same competitiveness uh, uh, in the rodeo arena that you do on the basketball floor. All right. So when's the last time that uh, you were on a horse? Um, it's probably been, um, I would say maybe, uh, 10 years ago or so, but, uh, I, I think I could still do it. You know, I could still get on that horse and, uh, and go, um, I sold my horses probably, I don't know, 25 years ago or a little bit longer. It just, uh, takes so much time and, and effort and there's nothing sadder than seeing a, a horse stand in the pen and not be used. So, uh, but, but I think I could still do it, you know, kind of like shooting a free throw. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nyla, we appreciate you joining us here on the A10 podcast, and best of luck uh, as you uh, finish up your non-conference schedule before you get into the A10 season. Uh, we appreciate it. I appreciate you having us on, and um, you know we're just excited. And, and you know our our goal right now is just to step on the floor and be better every day. And uh, I think with this group of young ladies, they certainly will. So I appreciate it. All right, and that'll wrap up this edition of the A10 podcast. Thanks for listening. 14 teams come to compete, but only one will win the crown. The Heart of the Nation will host the Atlantic 10 Men's Basketball Championship at Capital One Arena in March of 2018. Five days of nonstop basketball action. There can only be one champion. Don't miss this major college championship at Capital One Arena in Washington, D.C., March 7th through 11th, 2018. Buy your tickets now at Ticketmaster.com.